Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. The entire staff and every consultant of the Nevada Democratic Party has quit. This is after Democratic Socialists won every key leadership position of the party in a contested election on Saturday. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. If you go onto the Nevada Democratic Party website, you will see that not a single staff member is listed. This is because every staff member quit after Democratic Socialists won all party leadership roles on Saturday. According to The Intercept, Judith Whitmer, the newly elected party chair, was notified by the party's executive director, Alana Mounts, that the entire party staff and all consultants were resigning. Staffers claimed that Whitmer was going to fire them anyway, but she denied those claims. Whitmer won with the backing of the local chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America and the support of the party's progressive wing, aligned with Democratic Socialist Senator Bernie Sanders. Three other progressives backed by the DSA won the other four leadership positions, this effectively turning Nevada's Democratic Party into a socialist party. 2020 House candidate and progressive Jen Perelman responded to the news on Twitter saying, What the Democratic Socialists did to the Nevada Democratic Party, we're going to do the same here in Florida. Perelman had previously shared plans to replace what she calls establishment Democrats, starting at the local level all the way up to the White House. This is a plan shared by many far-left progressive and socialist activists. John Ralston, founder of the Nevada Independent, told CNN's Chris Saliza that those who don't support the newly elected Democratic Socialists in Nevada have vowed to set up a separate entity. This could mean two competing factions for the Democratic vote. Ralston says that with the 2022 elections just around the corner, Republicans could end up being the winners of this Nevada shakeup. Grace Coulter, NTD News. The new Commerce Secretary may have potential conflicts of interest because of a Chinese company. And a senator is questioning the NBA's deal with a Chinese propaganda mouthpiece. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. The U.S. Commerce Secretary owns a stake in a major Chinese tech corporation and parent company to Chinese messaging app WeChat. The news comes to light at the same time the Commerce Department is reviewing a ban on the app. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo and her husband own a stake in tech company Tencent. Their share is valued between $20,000 and $45,000. That's based on a financial disclosure filed in January with the Office of Government Ethics. Prior to her recent confirmation as Commerce Secretary, Ormondo promised to divest her other financial stakes to avoid potential conflicts of interest. But she failed to mention the Tencent stake. Ramondo and her husband did not invest directly into Tencent. They invested into two funds, composed of foreign stocks. Though Tencent holds the biggest position in the two funds. The Biden administration is reviewing the previous administration's executive orders related to China, including the order that banned transactions with Tencent. In February, Biden's Justice Department asked an appeals court to pause a case concerning the ban while it reviews the action. Twitter is suing Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. The company accuses Paxton of using his office to retaliate against Twitter for banning former President Trump. Colin Frederickson brings us more. Twitter is suing Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. The social media giant accuses Paxton of abusing his authority, intimidation and harassment. Twitter claims Paxton is targeting the company in retaliation for exercising their First Amendment rights. At issue are Twitter's moderation policies, including the decision to suspend former President Trump's account. Paxton says deplatforming Trump had a chilling effect on free speech. He also says social media companies operate like monopolies and should be regulated like utilities. Normally I'd say you're right. Private company can do what they want and, and consumers have choices. Here consumers don't have a choice. They have no choice. And so we have to regulate that and make sure that free speech is not being controlled by a few very wealthy uh, uh, tech people. Paxton is now demanding information on Twitter's moderation policies and practices. Twitter says in the lawsuit that disclosing its moderation policies could undermine their effectiveness. The company also says Paxton's demands run afoul of the First Amendment. 
Twitter argues it has the right to make decisions about what content to disseminate on its platform. The company is asking the court to block Paxton's efforts to obtain the information or otherwise probe Twitter's internal decisions. A bipartisan group in Congress is calling on President Biden to defend Hong Kong's basic freedoms. NTD's Molina Wise Cup has more details on the CCP's push for more control and U.S. Congress members' response to it. China's rubber stamp parliament is set to vote this week on a new set of rules to reform Hong Kong's election laws. It would add 300 members to the election committee responsible for choosing Hong Kong's chief executive. And if most of them are pro-Beijing as expected, it would make it harder for the CCP's political opposition to hold office. Beijing officials say the new rules will ensure the city is run by, quote, Chinese patriots. On Tuesday, U.S. lawmakers who oversee congressional China policy denounced the effort. Writing in a joint statement, these revisions will only continue to advance Beijing's ever-tightening grip on Hong Kongers' autonomy, basic freedoms, and fundamental human rights. They say Beijing is again violating its international commitments under the One Country, Two Systems Agreement. The Congress members say they will continue to speak up to protect the freedom of Hong Kongers, and they're calling on Biden to stand up too. The Congress members point out that they've passed legislation giving the executive branch new tools to support the people of Hong Kong, and they're urging the Biden administration to use those tools. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. They might need to raise the income tax even more if people start working four days a week. It's a new trend we're seeing across the country. NTD's Evelyn Lee reports. What if you had a three-day weekend? Some employers have been playing with the idea, and it seems like it's getting popular now. Companies like Unilever, Shake Shack, and Microsoft Japan have experimented with a shorter work week and reported good results. Julia Pollack, labor economist at ZipRecruiter, says that trend is gaining momentum. Uh, in a tightening labor market, employers have to pull out all the stops to expand their talent pools, and they have to appeal to semi-retirees and to parents who'd left the workforce to look after children and needed additional uh, schedule flexibility. According to Pollack, this has become even more prevalent with the pandemic. While one aspect is to appeal to potential employees, companies also report better productivity. Microsoft says its experiment not only improved productivity by 40 percent, but also reduced electricity bills. They're no longer losing time, you know, at the water cooler with, uh, you know, a lot of chatting and interruptions at the office and with unnecessary meetings. With better productivity and more time off, the software company Buffer says their employees experienced a better sense of work-life balance. But every Sunday night, I get this kind of pang of anxiety, like I haven't dealt with all the things that I needed to do on the weekend. According to Pollack, a four-day work week helps her to be more relaxed and satisfied. And it might become more common in the future. Uh, the growth rate is very, very swift. Uh, it, about, it was about 10, 12, you know, 13, 14, 15 jobs per 10,000 um, uh, in 2015, 2016, 2017. It gradually rose to about 40 jobs in uh, 10,000 in 2019. It's now gone up to around 60 jobs in, uh, in 10,000. So there's a very, very, very steep growth rate, but off a very low base. But critics say a shorter work week isn't feasible for all companies. A Utah study was forced to close because of poor customer satisfaction after multiple complaints about not being able to access government services on Fridays. Evelyn Lee, Entity News. There's a new relief fund in New York City for taxi drivers struggling to stay in business. It'll help them handle crippling business loans. Drivers needed a medallion to operate, and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Many medallion owners are struggling and have asked for assistance from the city. I speak with them every day. I have heard the pain in their voices that they have had to choose between making debt payments or providing their families with a roof over their heads and food on the table. The city has made $855 million in medallion sales in recent years, but their value has plummeted from over $1 million in 2013 to less than $200,000 now. It left thousands of drivers in debt. Uber and other ride-sharing services have taken much of the blame, but critics also blame the city and leaders who pushed immigrant drivers into risky loans.
Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.